Okay, thank you, everyone. So, as you already know, our today topic is developing countries. So, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. Firstly, I'm going to give you uh, the view of ideologies that are usually used when you want to have the countries that <laughs> are developing, how they can uh, get richer. Secondly, the factors that are influencing those things. Thirdly, I'm going to give you lots of examples of countries, both successful and uh, unsuccessful for both of those ideologies. And lastly, but not least important, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about IMF and uh, other developing programs. So, firstly about ideologies. So, in the debates, you usually have two ideologies that you are, uh, you are propping. So it's either free market or protectionism. So what is free market? Free market ideology, like neoliberal ideology, it, um, it has um, the laws of demand and supply. And the thing is that people who are supporting and think that the market will always solve, that you usually should, uh, <coughs> that the private sector is more efficient than state-owned sector, that uh, you should have less government spending, less interventions from the government, lower inflation, that inflation is rob robbing people from their ma money, and the state should not intervene in the market, and also that the, ta uh, the tariffs should be low, so that the export and import should be as higher as possible. What is the uh, thing with protectionism? They believe that when, especially for developing countries, that they need protectionism from the competition. Why? Because they have infant industries who are not that strong, and therefore they cannot compete with the foreign firms that are much more successful, have more money, more technologies, etc. So, and usually clashes are between those two ideologies. So free market ideology, Things that things are going to change because when new companies come, they come with new managerial know-how, with new technologies, with their new skills, and that, that competition is actually good because the good uh, members of the market from those developing countries will survive. But uh, protectionist people who are supporting protectionism believe that that's not going to happen. That usually those companies are going to have monopolies; they're going to destroy the other uh, companies, and that is a bad thing. So basically, you have the clash between those two ideologies. So of course, you're not just going to uh, have this really simplistic explanation, but those are just the grounds of those ideologies. There are many factors that are influencing. Okay. So the free market. Uh, okay, as I, as I explained uh, this already, I don't have to. So theory of comparative advantage. So theory of comparative advantage says that despite that one country is more, succe uh, more successful in producing everything than the other countries, still they should trade. Why? Because that theory says that country can cooperate because one country has interest to specialize itself in one thing that has most advantage and that the other countries will specialize in things, uh, in the sectors that they have the least disadvantage. So I'll give you an example going to be a little bit more clear. So for example, Germany can produce both soft toys and cars more efficiently than Guatemala. However, it's in German interest to specialize only for cars, so because they're going to earn much more rather than produce everything. So it's interest from Germany to trade with Guatemala, even though that Guatemala will, uh, will, will be like a little bit less efficient in producing stuff toys, because German will earn much more with producing cars. So that's why the theory of comparative advantage explains that even though one country is superior than the other, they should still trade. Also, the theory of comparative advantage said that there are differences between labor and capital. That some countries are much more richer in capital, like for example Germany, and the others much more richer in labor, like Guatemala, China, Vietnam, etc., etc. So they, they use those things to have comparative advantage. What are the problems? A couple of them. Firstly, because competition is usually too high, and because some uh, industries will be destroyed in those developing countries, as I explained already. And secondly, because it's really hard to transfer the new technologies, and that usually those developing countries are kept uh, underdeveloped. That means that they, even though they are becoming more developed, after some times, the richer countries don't have interest to send them more advanced technology. So they stay like on this level, and they don't go much higher, higher. And they say that with protectionism, if the state protects their market, if the state intervenes in the market, and protect the, infant, uh, the industry that are infant, that are not that powerful, that's better because after a while those companies will be competitive. Okay? So far so good. Industrialization. Now I'm going to talk about some factors 
that are really important in development. Firstly is industrialization. Industrialization means that you have more industry in the country, like self-explanatory. However, why it is better? Why, it is, why industrialization is better for developing countries? For a couple of reasons. Firstly, because we have less re resource-based economies. What does it mean? If you have resource-based economies, then those are economies that the, uh, the, uh, the waste, uh, the, their biggest amount of GDP is based on trading with resources. GDP is like gross domestic uh, uh, product, which means uh, different, yeah, you know what it is. Okay, great. I don't have to explain it. So we have two examples here. One example is Zambia, that they had 80% of GDP due to copper. What, what's the problem with that? Because when the demand for copper fell, the prices for copper fell, like consequentially. And the problem is because lots of their GDP was lost due to that. What was the problem with that is that even after a while, like for example, Nadola, that was the capital of copper belt, is now a ghost town. What was the problem that even after a couple of years, when demand in the copper rose again, Investors were afraid to invest there because they saw that uh, that industry failed. So that's why it's really important to have diversification. Industrialization brings much more industries, therefore much more diversification, and less of your economy is based on your resources. Another example is Ivory Coast. 70% of people were engaged in agriculture in the 1970s, and they have a peak growth of 360%. GDP per, per capita, that's like really low to grow. However, in the 1980s, they, have, <laughs> they didn't have growth, they had a decline of 22%. It's really problematic because they base 70% of their economy on agriculture, basically on, uh, on cocoa and coffee. That's, that's why it's really problematic. The industrialization brings much more diversification to the economy, so less likely to have those big flux, uh, fluctuations in the economy. Also, the other um, important thing is that more women will work. So even though it's like a benefit in itself that more women work and they have their own money, the benefit also they, they usually have less children. So for example, in Me when Mexico uh, entered NAFTA, North America Free Trade Association, <coughs> the average number of kids per woman dropped from seven to about two. So it's really huge drop. So why is this important? Because firstly, more women work; they are more powerful, etc. Aware of that argument, and secondly, it's important because they have less kids. Therefore, uh, they uh, they need less. Uh, thing, they they can afford. Uh, they can have better lives for those kids, and they can also work more because they don't have to go like uh, every <laughs> every second year like um, to the maternity leave. So it's really important. Uh, uh, the, that's that's why because of industrialization. Because with industrialization, usually you have those sweatshops. And 80% of the workers in sweatshops are women. Okay? So those are jobs that usually employ lots of women. So that's why it's really important, uh, that industrialization. Also, one more thing for industrialization is when you have industrialization, when you have industries, that means that you don't just sell the resources, that you more sell, uh, sell the products that are made. Why is this important? Because when you, have, when, you send, when, you, when you sell the product that is like finished product, you earn much more rather than you sell just a resource. So it's, that's why it is good. If you just sell like copper, you earn something, but you can, if you made something from that copper, you earn much more. So, and that's great with industrialization, okay? Foreign direct investments, or FDI. Foreign direct investments are like self-explanatory when some foreign companies, like or transnational corporations, come to your country and invest. <laughs> and it's obvious. Benefits are also obvious because more money to your economy, more employment because they, bring, they, they build factories. Managerial know-how because people who know how to do business go to those countries and teach. <laughs> the, the, the other manufacturers can learn how they, uh, how they deal with that. Uh, they can see their skills. Rational production because those companies usually have a um, are much more productive. So that's why it's better because the local firms see how to produce goods more uh, uh, better, efficiently. Also, technology transfer because lots of technology comes to those companies and they give them to them. Okay, what are the problems? Firstly, is tax havens. So it's not 
uh, is the thing that usually lots of transnational corporations are like settled in, I don't know, Monaco or some countries that are tax havens. So really little number of taxes go to developing countries. So that's why you can mitigate that argument. Secondly, unfair competition. Because they can usually just drop the prices, even though they lose for some time, the local firms can just go bankrupt and they can rise their prices. So it's unfair competition for local firms who cannot compete with really powerful transnational corporations. Also that they do not transfer their greenfield technology. That means that they don't create new technologies in those countries, they just some part of the, uh, of the technologies they outsource. And also terrible working conditions. I'm going to talk about, about that a little bit later. But you probably know the example, for example, of Foxconn, when people work, I don't know, 16 hours a day in terrible conditions. Uh, they don't have, uh, they don't have like uh, health insurance, etc. And they have even those suicide nets. So when they jump uh, uh, off the window and they want to kill themselves, they have nets to catch them and return to the jobs. It's really terrible conditions. Okay. Also, there is a thing that foreign direct investments can move away because it's foreign capital. So, for example, in, in 1997, when you had uh, Asia crisis, like big financial financial crisis in Asia, in Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, basically every country in Asia, uh, lots of foreign direct investments, lots of those companies move away to their home countries. But also, the thing is that usually that's not that, like that's true. Sometimes these really big crises, yes, some of them move away. But there are many reasons why they don't want to move away. Why is that? Firstly, because they have uh, usually, it's not really easy to move away all your technology. You have built infrastructure, you have factories. You cannot just take a factory with yourself to the other country. So that's the first reason. Secondly, uh, they have the attractiveness of the domestic market. So for example, China is really attractive mar market to those companies and it's much easier to sell their products to Chinese market if they are there. So even though that, uh, for example, wages may rise in China and it may, uh, for example, if wages of workers rise in China, some, someone may say that foreign direct investments will move away because it, it won't, they won't have interest to uh, deal with China. However, still they'll have lower wages than, for example, in Europe. And secondly, the domestic market is really, really uh, good. They can sell lots of goods so that they don't have interest to move away. Thirdly, they have the supplier network that they have built over years. Example of that is network for Japanese cars uh, that lots of car makers in Thailand and Malaysia buy Japanese cars. So they built that supply network in those countries. So it's not in the interest of those, like for uh, companies to move away, even though the wages in Thailand and Malaysia rose, okay? Next slide is about China. Now, usually when they, people say uh, the problems with uh, foreign direct investments or with trans transnational corporations because there is lack of regulation and working conditions are terrible. And usually they say, if, but if you regulate them, they will move away to the other countries. As I explained, there are many reasons why they don't want to do so. But also we have an example of China that regulate every, uh, foreign direct investments a lot. So for example, uh, foreign ownership ceilings, they have like the limits of how much of the, uh, the ownership of those companies can be the foreign. Also, uh, they have requirements that some of the trade will be with the local uh, companies, so the, that company can come there, but they need to have cooperation with local firms, at least 10%, for example. So it's good for those local firms. Thirdly, that uh, they still have to improve some working conditions, even though they are much worse than, for example, I don't know, in England, still they are much better than the local uh, working conditions. And even despite all those regulations that China has, still 10% of the foreign direct investments go to China. So that's why, even though we have some regulation, it is not true that they will move away the, the, the foreign investors. So if someone said in the debate, but if we regulate, regulate those foreign investments, those companies will move away, if those, if those poor people won't have anywhere to work, you can just say it's not true. It's like, there are many reasons why lots of them won't move away, okay? And another example is Vietnam. Now, firstly, Vietnam had 2.5 million children who used to work, like, 
child labor was legal in Vietnam 20 years ago. Nowadays it's illegal. They don't work. They go to school, which is much better than to work. Why? Because uh, <coughs> because they had growth and lots of they earn much more money because they were attracted to the foreign direct investment investments that came there. And that's why lots of them uh, actually are getting richer, so they don't have to send their children to work, rather to school. So that's changed in the Vietnam, it's like a good change. Even though in the short term, you can argue, yes, maybe in short term those working conditions are really bad, or some things are bad, but that's going to change as soon as people get richer. So one example is that. Secondly, the average wage. So, like Nike has lots of uh, factories in Vietnam, so despite that $45, that's average wage in Nike, is not a huge wage for people working, I know, even in Serbia. However, in Vietnam it's a lot. And in state-owned enterprises, so the, com the company is owned by state, the average wage is $18. So even though the, those wages are low, they are still much higher than the other wages by the state. So it's really like, beneficial to have foreign direct investments. Thirdly, about training activities. Like Nike has lots of training activities to their workers, so they gain new skills. They need to teach the skills to their workers because they didn't want to have skillful workers, and because they have interest to have motivated workers, so they earn more. So they have more profit. And finally, uh, infrastructure. So because they need to build lots of factories, they need to pave the lots of roads uh, from those factories to the cities, etc. And now those roads were like jungle. Nowadays there are lots of like local shops they sell something, and also Nike works with them, etc. Okay, so is it fine? So it's always there are some reasons why something will happen, something bad or good might happen. In the debate, you need to even out what is more likely to happen and why, and to give some examples. Okay, the other factor that is really mm, influencing is internet. Now, obviously, inter I mean, it's obvious when you have internet, it's better for a country because more people can access information, I don't know, democracy, uh, education, etc. Right? Those things are obvious, and you all know how to make those arguments, so I don't want to spend lots of time with that. However, I'll give you some really cool examples. <coughs> Firstly, uh, okay, just one example, but it's fine. The exa example is in Kenya, that they have mobile money, it's called M-Pesa, as you see on the, on the slide. Well, the thing is that in Kenya you don't have regulated uh, internet and uh, like telecom and those technology uh, market. So you have competitions. So for example, the other example is Ethiopia that they regulate uh, those uh, internet services and mobile services and they don't have competition. They don't have like uh, state-owned uh, uh, internet providers. So that's why internet is much more expensive in Ethiopia rather than Kenya, also less people have access to internet in Ethiopia than Kenya, and those two countries are really sim similar because they're basically all both in the, uh, in the east of Africa, so you can't argue, but those are different examples because they're really similar. So how was M-Pesa beneficial to Kenya? A couple of things. Firstly, because it saves lots of times. So in the, in the past, people who were like, I don't know, living in the... <coughs> in the villages and they, they had to go to the cities to pay, I don't know, the taxes, stuff like that. Now they can do it uh, via mobile phones, which is really beneficial because it saves time and it saves costs. You don't have to go to the city to pay taxes. Furthermore, because it attracts IT investors, so yeah, uh, uh, companies like IBM, Microsoft, Intel, Google and Nokia are investing in Kenya much more than in any other East Africa country. And the World Bank estimates that 1% of the growth is due to technology. So it's a lot. If they have growth like 4 or 5%, 1% is estimated the World Bank is due to technology. <coughs> there are similar programs that are now starting in Afghanistan, India and Tanzania. We're going to see how that's going to happen. Also, the thing is that with the banking, that now we have, they have lower interest rates because it's much easier to repay your, um, your credits. And so, the, because costs are lower, the banks can be, give uh, credits with much lower interest rates to those people, which is beneficial for people who want to start their own businesses, for example. So, internet can be really, really beneficial, and you can have that example, if you're somehow going to prove that you have more internet and technology, or less internet and technology, okay? 
Okay, now human rights violations. So, okay, I already explained the fox film, the suicide events, and the, the low working standards, the working standards are really, really bad. And there are a couple of answers that usually some uh, use, people use in the debates. One is that that's going to change to the future. That's true. I mean, because people are getting richer, they're demanding more rights. They want, want to have better working conditions. They, it's not the matter of life or death, whether they're going to work once they become richer. So that thing is like true. It cannot be um, somehow rebuttaled. This is not going to happen. But it can be said, yes, but we cannot wait for 10 years. So somebody, something will change because those working conditions are really terrible. Those people get cancers and, I don't know, lots of generations. Yeah, it's sad story, I know. A lot of generations are <coughs> lost and it's really, really a bad thing, immoral, blah, blah, blah. Second thing that people use are boycotts. So they say like, yeah, but if people in the West see that their products are made in terrible working conditions, they're going to boycott those things. Some of them will, but they don't really work. If you see that iPhone 7, when, they, when it came out, like people were literally <laughs> jumping over, <laughs> over the other people just to buy them, even though the Apple uh, made all uh, make all the products in, in the Foxconn in China in those terrible suicide and working conditions. Still, people don't care. Lots of people don't care. Or they just say, yeah, but at least they have some jobs. So boycotts don't work. If someone says boycotts work, it's just a, some couple of leftist people who will maybe boycott, but it's not enough for the companies to change their behavior. <coughs> There is one case of the boycotts at work. It was Adidas that lots of students abroad boycotted Adidas because of terrible working conditions in their factories, and Adidas improved them because they wanted to be like a really uh, <coughs> because they wanted to be uh, I'm a company that has a good image. The other example of a company that uh, wants to have a good image and that's why they want to have fair trade of everything is Starbucks. So they are basically having fair trade. Uh, agreements with coffee suppliers, with products, uh, cups, and everything, because they market themselves as the fair trade. But there are not really lots of examples of those companies, so they are much more. Uh, they're not the common rule, okay? So, but you can use them and spin information, of course. Another example of human rights abuse is of only people in Nigeria. <coughs> so, in the south of Nigeria, there are, there are Ogoni people, Ogoni tribes. And there's lots of oil. Shell is extracting oil. Shell, the Dutch company, Royal Dutch Shell. Okay, the problem is because the Nigerian government is not the most democratic government in the world. <laughs> so despite the thing that they have like free elections, still there are much more, much lots of, uh, they, they, there's lots of corruption, there is like no rule for law, uh, some parts of the country are even <laughs> not controlled by the state. The thing is that uh, the company, the Shell, has close ties with the government. Now, why has this been uh, problematic? Because uh, Shell doesn't care about their workers, they just want to have the cheapest production of oil. So, they, they, Nigeria basically used the paramilitary forces to crush protests when they were not satisfied with the working conditions. The second problem is environmental damage. Because, you know, Nigerian politicians get some money from the Shell. And basically, they don't care what working condition they, uh, the workers are going to have and what environmental consequences they're going to have. Lots of rivers are basically poisoned, lots of fish died, etc. etc. It's really problematic because when people protested, Nigeria just used paramilitary forces to crush protests. This is really bad. So, the thing is also that Nigeria had a growth. But lots of that money didn't went to the people who were workers. They still kept the religious law. However, they went to the state and to the corrupt, corrupt politicians. So when you have weak governments, you can easily argue, like with this example, or with many other examples, like for example, Coca-Cola in Swaziland or Coca-Cola in Colum Colombia. Uh, there's also some, uh, yeah, there are many examples, but one, I presented you this one, you can Google the others if you want. <coughs> Still more than 70% of Nigerians live under one dollar per day, which is not a lot, despite that the Nigerian government gets lots of money. So basically there are some cases that working conditions don't improve at all. However, after really, really lots of uh, bad things that Shell did, there were some altruistic lawyers from England, <laughs> I never thought that I'm going to find out that, but yeah, some people like that exist, that uh, were, took the cases. Uh, and represented the Ogoni people, 
and now 15 billion dollar settlements will be given to uh, Gomini people in Nigeria. So in that example, you can like spit in that even if something is really really bad, he knows blah blah blah. After all, the justice will be served, and <coughs> those settlements will be paid at least something to those people. So it's not like that those new transnational corporations are really ruling the world, but yeah, there is also some checks and balances that we can have. Okay. If you have any, exam uh, any examples or questions, you can like raise your hand. <coughs> the another thing is microcredits. So yeah, we had the motion on euros that this house believes that micro uh, microcredits should be uh, only given to women. So we also debated, I think, uh, this course. Okay. So those are credits who are targeting impoverished borrowers. So borrowers who are really poor. Also, if they have low interest rates, sometimes not at all interest rates, uh, long repayment time, so like conditions are really, really good. <coughs> 74, uh, 4 million people are using nowadays. The, uh, the worth is $38 uh, $8 billion, as you can see in the slide. Uh, <coughs> the thing is that 95 to 98% of repayment is successful. So people think that yeah, it's, good, it's really good statistic that 98% of those people are repaid. And they use the example that microcredits work and they uh, like uh, <coughs> give uh, opportunity to people who are really poor to start their businesses. That's true to some extent, but the thing is that in those governments, like for example in Bangladesh, when those microcredits are really, really lost use, the, those banks that, <coughs> that they are uh, uh, giving those microcredits have lots of power. So basically they come with, uh, with guns to your home and ask for the money, so you don't have much more <laughs> choices. Rule of law is bad, and Bangladesh uh, police is like bad, state is corrupted. So even though the repayment uh, rate is good, successful, lots of people need to take another microcredit to repay the former one or the another, or they can uh, <coughs> ask uh, for the like Ill illegal people to borrow the money. So even though the, those statistics show that microcredits work, still it's terrible for those people. Also, they have um, <coughs> as a goal to reduce gender inequality. So there are a couple of uh, examples like Bankasol, WWB and Prom here that are uh, <coughs> only giving the microcredits to women. Also the problem is, first, okay, it's obvious why it would be better that women uh, have more power and more capital. I think that you all know how to explain that. But still, you can mitigate it easily that firstly, lots of husbands just say to their wives or daughters or whatever, just okay, go there and ask for the microcredit. So they are still the bosses, or they take those money away from the women. Secondly, that those uh, <coughs> projects, when they want to repay that money, they ask the women for repayment. So even though that woman is not in charge of the capital, she is the one that's asked. There were even some examples of threatening of uh, the violence, sexual, uh, sexual harassment of those women if they didn't have uh, money to repay. So even though those uh, microcredits sounds really altruistic and cool, they're not so cool. <laughs> they are really, really huge harms to the people they're giving money to. Okay. Also, the other thing is reduction of uh, diversity of services. So because lots of NGOs see that lots of people are given that microcredits, they are less likely to do the other things like uh, invest money in education, etc. because they believe that microcredits are the most efficient one. So you can easily argue that microcredits actually are not that good and they also make the NGOs shift their uh, <coughs> entrepreneurship to microcredits so they are less likely to invest the other things that are intrinsically good like education for example. Okay? <coughs> Yeah, but still, yeah, of course you can argue that, but still she may be, uh, 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 she can be the owner, but still her husband may be in charge, because she's not that powerful, uh, she, she, might, she may be less educated because those countries are strongly patriarchal, and still, even though she might be an owner on paper, lots of control is in the husband has. But you can argue that it's one step toward inequality, and some women will be empowered, and in the know, long term, more women will be so, that, yeah, it's debatable, but it can also be easily mitigated that lots of those uh, <coughs> uh, 
uh, money that uh, lots of those funds don't go to work at all. Okay? Okay, now to have examples, the countries that used uh, both free market and protectionist. First example is Singapore. Singapore was really poor 50 years ago. They had lots of foreign direct investments. They had lots of uh, liberalization of the trade. Nowadays they are really, really rich country. They are one of the richest countries in Asia. So the, those are, uh, Singapore is one uh, of the examples of so-called Asian miracle <coughs> economies that they were really, really poor and now they are really, really rich. However, there are still some things that are not so neoliberal in Singapore. For example, one is that home ownership. So 85% of housing is provided by housing developing world. So that means that 85% of housing is state owned. And usually uh, free trade uh, economies say that you need to own your own land because then you are more motivated, you are in one charge, etc. etc. Singapore is a counter example of that, that still 85% of the housing is owned by the, by, the, <coughs> by the state. It can be still refuted by saying that Singapore is highly urbanized. That means that people don't have don't, don't work in village, so it doesn't matter whether you have your uh, flat or not. But for example, in Kenya, when people are living in rural areas, it is really important whether uh, the the the, uh, the soul where you're working is state-owned or your, because if it's yours, you are more likely incentive to invest in it, because then all revenues come to you and not loss of them to state. So okay, it can be split if you know about it. Secondly, is about state-owned enterprises. So Singapore has lots of state-owned enterprises. Singapore Airlines is one real example. It's a national company. It's really, really successful. And uh, <coughs> it's really competitive, despite that it's a national company. It's state-owned. It's state -owned, okay? So uh, I don't think it's really... I don't think that that example is relevant to the developing economies debate, but it can be used when someone says that, yeah, the state-owned enterprises are less successful than the private. You can use that as a counterexample and also some, uh, if you want to mitigate that state-owned enterprises are not that bad. Okay? Yes? Who is its competition and how are they competing and how are they being better? Well, I don't know, with Malaysia Airlines, with other airlines, and they are really successful. Yeah. I don't have some <laughs> more information if you want, but <coughs> I don't have it. But it's like the known example in the Bayland of successful state-owned company. Okay? The another example is Taiwan. They use the same thing as Singapore. They had the land reform. So Taiwan is less or was less urbanized than Singapore. So they had the land, they had the land reform. The people who were owners of their land. <coughs> Real wages rose, ten, they are now 10 times higher than they were in the 1970s. Also, you have the argument that in the 80s they had a larger middle class and they, uh, asked, they, don't, they asked for democracy. And despite the Taiwan was a dictatorship, they now have democracy and elections, etc. And usually you have an argument that when people become richer, they want more rights, they want to have democracy. I think the good example of that is Taiwan. So you can research a little bit more if you want. <coughs> the other example is Slovakia. So Slovakia lagged behind Czech Republic. They were like, okay, Czechoslovakia was one country, you know it. <laughs> so uh, Slovakia was much more poorer. However, they introduced the uh, neoliberal measures like flat tax. The tax was the same for all branches of 19%. They privatized basically everything, including the pension system. And they're really now successful. They have one of the most stable growth. And they're much more successful than Czech Republic now because they have much more liberalized. liberalized. Uh, <coughs> sorry? The, the same tax. So despite, uh, it doesn't matter whether you, are a small, uh, whether you have a small shop or a big company, you still pay the same tax. Okay? Because usually taxes are different uh, depending on how much you are rich. Okay? <coughs> but you can also argue that Slovakia is an extreme example. Because of two things. Firstly, they had lots of EU funds due to the fall of Berlin Wall. After that, lots of EU, <laughs> EU countries wanted to give lots of money unconditionally, basically, to the Eastern Europe because they think that they wanted to have better cooperation with them. So it, it's some, somehow extreme. And secondly, because German car industry needed additional market, they did, needed additional workers. And Slovakia was close to them, so they came there and they, they had like, like special <laughs> occasions. So Slovakia, even though it's a good example, it's somehow 
special. And you can say, yeah, but it's extreme case due to those, those things, and that's why protectionism will work in those countries, okay? Also, the good example is uh, Estonia, but basically the same as Slovakia. They were like part of the Eastern Bloc, and then they had lots of funds, and now they are cool. <coughs> now to a little bit bad, <laughs> bad examples. One is Russia. Now, the problem with Russia, Russia also introduced so-called shock therapy, like uh, <coughs> flat tax, privatization, etc. However, privatization in Russia was bad, so it created oligarchs. So it means that people who are really close to the government, they bought lots of things under their, uh, for, for the while it, was, while it was much less than uh, it was market value. If it reminds you of some countries like Serbia, it, yeah, <laughs> because it, <laughs> it is the same basically. The problem is that those oligarchs were not so successful. They didn't get that lots of money to those, uh, back to the country. Lots of the companies uh, like failed. Also, 85, 80% uh, of the farms bankrupted in Russia after those shock therapies. So basically, it's really, really, it was problematic with, because of unemployment, also people lost their jobs. So the Russia is an example of a, like a bigger country that introduced <coughs> the free trade uh, measures and failed drastically. And then it had 1997, the Russia uh, crisis due to that. However, it can be argued also that the Russia crisis was uh, partially due to Asia crisis because Asia and Russia had lots of trade and they were at the same time. So basically, it may say that yes, those farms needed to go bankrupt because they were not really successful in the market. So we don't care. They would bankrupt either way. They, wouldn't, they, they were not earning more money than they were spending. And that, that Russia crisis was due to an Asia crisis and the other crisis that happened at the uh, globe. So it was not due to neoliberal measures. Okay? <laughs> Another example is Chile. Okay, you probably know about the coup d'etat in Chile by Augusto Pinochet. You know? Okay? So basically, Chile was a <coughs> socialist country, but CIA, CIA arranged the coup d'etat. So <coughs> the general uh, came to power. They privatized everything. They uh, had huge cuts of government spending on social services, education, um, pension system, everything. They just like cut lots of uh, <coughs> services. However, they had a huge crisis in 1982 that finished with nationalization of all banks. So they needed to <laughs> go step behind. However, despite of that, they're still much more liberalized than any other South American country. They're still the richest, the richest South American country. They are still, there is still a huge amount of inequality in Chile, but it can be argued that like, this is better than this. So even though it's unequal, still poor people have more money than they would have otherwise. Also, <clears throat> we can be saying that Chile, despite that they were extremely neoliberal, there were some things that they didn't do properly. Like for example, they had huge spendings on government, on, on, uh, on army, because it was a military dictatorship. So lots of money needed to be spent for military generals and for mil military, uh, military in general. So that's why I can say that Chile, despite it was really uh, neoliberal uh, example, still it's not pure neoliberal. And it's an extreme example because no one didn't care about it. They just wanted to have experiment. Okay? Now some examples for protectionism. The positive example is Korea. So, uh, Korea was really, really poor 50 years ago because they had the Second World War. They were a Japanese colony. They had the Korea War, like South War, you know. So they had lots of wars. They were really poor. Lots of uh, <coughs> their trade was based on trading, like they were selling the wigs made of human hair and I don't know tuna fish or something like that. So that was the the, the crux of their economy. Nowadays, it's high tech products like you know the I don't know cameras. Uh, mobile phones, etc. How did they do that? In 1973, they had heavy and chemical industrialization plan. So the president introduced the plan which was huge import bans, high tariffs, exceeds tariffs until the industry would become strong enough. So they protected the internet industries. The government spent a lot of money to boost the <coughs> spending and to create the, uh, the new industries. They were really, really successful in that. However, still you can say that Korea was an extreme example somehow because they had lots of funds because it was uh, when the Cold War uh, was actually uh, when the Cold War was uh, really a thing. So the Americans gave lots of money to them. So that's why it was uh, it was possible. They had enough money to have protectionism. 
Usually the countries that are now developing countries don't have that money to boost those economies, and, uh, those, uh, <coughs> those um, industries and to protect them. However, Korea had because they had lots of funds from, for example, the United States. Okay? Another example for protectionism is Ethiopia. It's a bad example. Okay, it has a pros and cons, but generally it's worse. <coughs> they had an IMO new project. So they, they build decent infrastructure. So Sirja told you about Keynes and about uh, it's better to spend a lot because it creates jobs and the economy has more, I don't know, spending it's more active and you have growth. You know, you know about that. Okay, so they, they use the, the Keynes mechanism. The, the good thing is because they have now decent infrastructure, they have, for example, better roads than in Kenya. Also, that they overcame the famine, as you know, that Ethiopia basically had people who were starving to death. Now there is no, because 79% of workers are working in agriculture. However, still, average wage is $400. In the rest of, the, of East Africa, it's $1,400. So it's much less than in the neighborhood countries. Also, there are women have 4.5 kids per woman, which is problematic highly because lots of uh, economies based on agriculture. In the future, they won't be able to produce enough food for all those people. So that's why it's problematic. That's why they need industrialization really, really fast. Also, they don't have land ownership, so therefore people are less motivated to work uh, and produce more of their uh, of the goods on their farms because they are not their farms. And lots of uh, the things that they earn need to get to the state, so that's why they're less motivated. And for example, Ethiopian Airlines and Telecom don't have competition, they are protected by the state. So that's why less people in Ethiopia than, for example, in Kenya, as I was explaining before, use internet and have uh, our internet literacy. So are, that's why all the benefits that Kenya has, they don't have. So that's why Ethiopia, even though they have better infrastructure, but still, just because you have a road that is better paved, that doesn't make your country much better if your people are poor. Okay? So the protectionism usually don't work in reality, but in the debate it can work. You have good examples, you have bad examples, the same as the neoliberal. You just view how you're going to explain and how we're going to explain that the nowadays scenarios are more similar to some of those examples. Okay? IMF. <coughs> okay, IMF International Monetary Fund. You know that um, that's basically <laughs> most of the countries are part of it. The benefits are that uh, the countries can get information on economic policies of the member countries, technical assistance in banking and fiscal affairs, and fina financial support in times of payment difficulties. So when your country has lots of debt, the IMF people may come to you and give you loans, etc. Okay? So you know how it works. However, um, yeah. okay, the problem with IMF are conditions. Because they have strong conditions that upon the countries they give loans. And those conditions are based upon neoliberal agenda. So that means that you should have free trade, you should lower your, uh, your tariffs, that means you have less revenues from the tax, that means that the transnational corporations can come to your countries, that means also less government spending, so that means that usually for developing countries that they need to fire lots of people. That's why people in the street of Athens were pissed off because they need to be fired. So IMF has huge, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, it has huge, huge free trade bias. Okay, so why is that? Because of voting, no. Because of voting power. So the voting power in IMF is not democratic. So it's not that Kenya has one vote and the United States has one vote. It's rather that one dollar is one vote. I.e., the countries that give most money have most voting power. So for example, USA has 18% of the voting power. A couple of countries combined that are really uh, <coughs> the rich have 38 percent of the voting power. The, pr the problem is that 85 percent of votes is needed for most of the decisions. And if you see the numbers, it's not rocket science to see that the United States has veto on all the things. So for those countries who are richer because they have more voting power, it's in their usually they have the policies that are in their own interest. So that's why they are pro. Uh, free trade because for American companies it's in their interest to have free trade and go to Kenya and use their resources and labors, etc. Okay, so it's not maybe a good thing, but it's how it is. Some of those things are changing. So in 2008 they had reform, 6% of the shift to developing markets. So the richer countries get less vote and developing countries get a little bit more, but still 
they have Pito, <laughs> they can just, they, they, they have the power over there. You can argue that, is a good, that is a normal thing because they provide most of the money, but still it's not fair because those countries are desperately needing loans to get their debts repaid and they don't have much alternatives, so that's why uh, they ask IMF, IMF for help. Okay, IMF conditioning, I was explaining that. Okay, some examples of IMF. Um, Argentina. So Argentina had huge problems in 1991 with hyperinflation and recession. They privatized basically everything. So YPF, that is their company for, for oil, oil extraction, etc., was privatized. It was sold, not sent. I don't know why it's written that way. Okay, it was sold for 2.5. 2.5 instead of 25 billion dollars. So <laughs> lots of money was like uh, wasted. They had lots of foreign direct investments due to those neoliberal things, but however they had higher unemployment because lots of people who are working in the government got they were just kicked off a lot of their jobs. Also 95% of food was produced in Argentina, but after many, that was the president that came in 1991, Argentina need to import food. So basically, they really failed because lots of that agriculture thing was produced by by the state. However, when they had those liberalization, those companies just bought off that those land, and they could have the industries that might be beneficial for the growth. But still, like for example, they needed to import food. Okay, what happened is that they had really big problems with the economy, as you can see. Those things are not that important in details. But the problem is that you have a picture that Argentina what didn't have good economy. In 2005, IMF have conditions, and those conditions will apply. So those conditions, uh, those conditions were applied to some extent before, but never fully. In 2005, they fully applied, uh, applied all IMF conditions, and their debt, external debt, started to go, to go down. So they were really successful example of IMF. What was wrong with Argentina? Well, they had lots of debt. They asked basically every bank in the world for the loans. The problem is that lots of banks sold their uh, so, uh, so, so, uh, sold their ownership over that loans or whatever it's called to the hedge funds. And most of the hedge funds and the banks agreed to some repayments because they, did, they couldn't have, Argentina couldn't repay all of the things with the full interest rates, so they had to have some repayments. Schemes. However, one hedge fund was so shitty they didn't want to accept those conditions from Argentina. And they sued Argentina in the US court and they won. So that's why the Argentina needed to repay them lots of money with huge, uh, <coughs> with huge interest rate. They didn't have that money and they go to the bankrupt. I think it's not called officially bankrupt, but it's, it's like selecting the default or whatever, but <laughs> I think it's just a euphemism for, uh, for bankrupt. It, uh, it means they just announced they cannot repay their debts. That means that they cannot also take any loans uh, any other loans that they need more, and also they have lots of problem. Okay, so this problem also they have problem with uh, with other investments because people see that that market is not sustainable. They don't want to go there, etc. Okay, so it's really good, well, not a good thing to say you got bankrupt, but it is how it is. So Argentina, even though uh, they had the problems with the IMF before, when they fully applied the conditions, they were starting to get better. They got worse because of the other things, because of the hedge fund that was shitty. But however, still, they, were, they can be argued as a good example of the IMF condition. A bad example, African countries. Lots of African countries have lots of, cheap, uh, lots of materials that are really rare, only existing in a few of the countries, and lots of people who don't have jobs. That means when those rich countries apply conditions to the African countries, usually the consequences that those African countries are source of, source of cheap materials and cheap labors. So the companies can come there, have a terrible working condition for their labors, and extract lots of those cheap materials. This is highly problematic because those governments don't get lots of uh, revenues back. Also, the problem is that lots of government's spending is cut. Is cut. So, like, for example, when Greece cut some of the government spending, that means that some of the people will need to pay education. It is a bad thing. Also, it means that some people have less pensions. It's also a bad thing. But when some really poor countries cut the government spending, it means that some people might not. It's just like that. Those people don't have that money. 
the most huge problem with, IG, uh, with IGIV that lots of people are did I pronounce it? HIV. HIV, yeah, okay. HIV. Okay, AIDS. So uh, the problem with AIDS is that lots of people, as you know, in South Africa, lots of people have AIDS. <coughs> and the problem is that countries usually have subsidized for the AIDS uh, medicines that are really expensive, expensive even here in I mean, Serbia, expensive. In Africa, they're much more expensive. And lots of those spendings were cut due to IMF conditions. So it's really bad because lots of people died earlier of it. However, those things changed when some of the I know, NGOs and lots of the pressure was put that those things change. Also, those things change when African countries stopped paying uh, the patent, uh, the, what's called, the, the rights of the patent of the companies. Uh, for, the, for those medicines, so they imported the medicines that were fake medicines. They are still effective, but they don't have a trademark. So, because of that, they are also less spending money. Yes? Did the uh, companies willingly give the patents or from the NGO? Sorry? Did the patents, uh, did they willingly give away the price of the patent uh, or did it happen through NGO activists? No, governments did it. Because those patents are owned by a transnational corporations, yes. yeah, and governments did it. They bought, they bought the fake medicines from, for example, Thailand, rather than from Europe. So governments did it. And the companies in Sweden. They did. However, the thing is that Nelson Mandela was really successful in 2000, in the years around 2000, and he had lots of credibility. And it's famous case, Nelson Mandela versus pharmaceutical com companies, you can Google it. But um, <laughs> the thing is that since he was really successful and credible, he had lots of attention and he just cried for the help and saved a lot of people are dying because of AIDS. It is not fair that those companies are uh, suing them. So that company had a settlement with South Africa and with the other countries. But I think that it can be really easily explained that that uh, settlement was possible because Mandela was someone who was really, really successful. He got the Nobel Prize and he, uh, yeah, he won uh, or apartheid in South Africa. So he was really, really uh, a dude in that time. So that's why he could get the settlements. But nowadays, I don't think that Zambian president would be so successful. Okay. Another example: successful is Turkey. They also strictly implemented all policies. And they nowadays they don't have any job with the IMF because they repaid all their debt. So they are a really, really good, successful example. However, <coughs> there, are, uh, there are three reasons why people say that Turkey was a really successful example of IMF. One is that uh, AKP, the most successful part in Turkey, had absolute power. So they didn't have to have uh, <clears throat> like coalition of problems, like for example the people in Greece have. So when they have to have harsh uh, policies, when you have just one party that is in power, they can just have it implemented. When you have two or three, they need to cooperate and argue over, over the things how they're going to implement. So it's much more uh, efficient if you have just one party. So that's why I have, uh, could have, uh, have uh, the policies strictly implemented. Otherwise people can uh, just whine about it. Also secondly, the growth. That Turkey, despite they were having strictly policies, they still have growth. So people still get they were getting richer. And usually, problem, for example, now in Europe, is that people are pissed off because they don't have more money, and still the, their uh, their revenues are lowered by the state. So people are going to on the street and protest. In Turkey, it was not the case because they had growth. Okay, so that's why they could they could have strictly implemented the, those policies. And thirdly, that the central bank was outside of the political sphere. So the, the ties between the central bank and the politicians was not so uh, strong. So that's why the central bank was much more independent. Therefore, the policies that I had were much more efficient. Okay? So that's why you can say that Turkey was somehow sweet. Okay? So we are approaching to the end. World Bank. World Bank is basically similar to the IMF. Just the IMF, they have different uh, goals. Like IMF gives you consulting, for example, but World Bank uh, gives you loans to develop your uh, economy to reduce poverty, climate change. So usually those terms are used together, like IMF and World Bank. They're just <laughs> two organizations that are really close. They both 
uh, use neoliberal agenda and they all, the working power is similar, etc. But however, World Bank has some funds that are like for combating climate changes. Okay, so it's somehow different because World Bank is more on developing countries and IMF is more like uh, on giving them consulting and also giving loans. So usually those, uh, those two organizations are working together. Are the same countries uh, in both organizations? Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that Russia, a couple of years ago, Russia was not in the World Bank, but now it is. So I think that every country basically is in both of those. Okay. Is the voting process of the same? The same. So the rich country has it. It's basically the same as the IMF. Okay. Now to the alternatives. I think it's the last slide. <clears throat> so IMF is the most powerful. They have the most money. That's why lots of those, uh, <clears throat> lots of uh, countries ask for the loans from the IMF. However, there are some of the alternatives. Some of them are existing. Some of them are not. One is African Monetary Fund. It is not existing. But the African Union wanted to have the fund and to have like their policy will be uh, they are uh, going towards to creating African Monetary Fund. Okay, so they want they have initiative to have that fund. So because they, they can borrow easily and they have they can have conditions that are much more adjusted to specific cases. Another is the BRICS bank. So BRICS like Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So those five countries that are really have huge role, they want to have bank that will have completely different conditions rather than the IMF. So they uh, they don't want to have that neoliberal neoliberal agenda. They want to have more uh, Keynesianism things. They all they had the agreement this year about creating BRICS bank. They all, but uh, it's more about idea. They don't have exact who is going to be a president of the bank, which country is going to provide, which to which extent, how much money. But there is some initiative to have that. Third is regional organizations. The, I think that regional organizations need lecture for itself, but for example, EU has some funds that can provide to the other countries. Then the OPEC, the countries that are exporting oil, uh, African Union, some organizations in Latin America, there are a lot of Asian in, uh, in Asia. Okay, so there are many of those regional organizations. I just think of, if you know something about them, just think about it or Google about it. I cannot talk about them because every of those organizations is different. So that's why they need a separate lecture. But just here to mention it. Fourthly is China. I put it here China and Africa because usually it is China going to Africa. So the China model of development is that China go to countries, usually they are in Africa, I think that all of them are in Africa. They build the infrastructure and in return they take the raw materials. Okay, so you can be say that it's good because it creates some of the jobs, it creates some of the infrastructure. But I think it easily can be mitigated for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because lots of them are supporting dictators like Mugabe in Zimbabwe, like a bad dictator. They're supporting them because it's much easier for a country that is not democratic to cooperate with China because they can just ask for whatever and get it from the dictator and the democratic regimes have some checks and balances. So that is the first problem. Secondly, is that that infrastructure is just, sh even though it's long term, they don't use it. If they don't have money, if they don't have companies that stay there, what they are going to do with the roads? They're just <laughs> roads. <laughs> so even, they build some of the things, but usually the African countries don't have money to use them because they don't sell, they don't, they don't send the factories there, okay? Third problem is because also the workers who are working are Chinese. So they're not even employing African people, they're taking Chinese people from China, they build something and they go away, so the African people don't have jobs at all. So even though there is some investments, those investments are usually not that beneficial to the people. Yes, Alexander? Yeah, it's some of the benefit. But comparatively, it can be said that it's better to have the foreign direct investments and the companies that come there and build their factory because of these are they employ their people and they also build some infrastructure, etc. And like that. I think it's that's it. Are there any questions? Okay, so if there are not, thank you for your attention.